see everyone here. And I am particularly thrilled tonight for two very specific reasons. The first one is due to a gentleman seated over in the second row on the end. Um, he served the school for 50 years. My understanding is that calculates to 101 connections uh, that he was here. This is Professor America Sinclair Black, for those of you uh, who didn't have the wonderful opportunity to study with him before he retired last year. But when he retired last year, he gave the school, he established the Sinclair Black Endowed Chair in the Architecture of Urbanism. And this past fall, he gave the school a significant gift to establish the Sinclair Black Endowed Excellence Fund for Urban Design. This fund will not only transform teaching in urban design, but will also serve to advance the School of Architecture's partnerships with the City of Austin and with many, many of the local communities, local community serving organizations that we have here. The fund will be used to support faculty with distinction and expertise in urban design and bringing visiting critics. Lecturers will sponsor outreach events and activities and also support students. You're going to be hearing an awful lot more about this. We'll be doing a public rollout, press release, uh, all the things that, that uh, a gift of this kindness um, absolutely deserve in, in the next several weeks. But I wanted all of you to know tonight uh, and to recognize the man who made such a difference for our school, who will be making such a difference for our school. And we also... <laughs> but I also wanted to bring it up as a connection to the second reason um, that, that tonight is special. Um, the funds from his gift were used to bring in tonight's really remarkable lecture, uh, John Skets. And many of you have already seen uh, his exhibit that's taking place right now in the New Game Gallery. Uh, this titled Regular City Construction of Idea, Past and Future. So these are among the very first groups of this uh, incredible gift, transformational gift, that this industry can see the plan is just sort of welcoming uh, one of the most influential scholars I've ever had a chance to come across. Um, I'm going to turn this over to Dean Almi to introduce uh, Professor Busquets, but I just had to bring in something a little bit more personal for me. In my very first semester, when I was doing, uh, doing my graduate studies in architecture, um, there was a buzz in the school, this is at Harvard, there was a buzz in the school, um, and I was told that I had to go to a lecture of Javon Busquets. <coughs> Um, I was thinking, I don't do urban design stuff. You know, I don't really need to go to this lecture. But I thought, absolutely had to go. I went. I am perhaps one of his biggest fans. Became absolutely fascinated with his work. I followed his work for years. I've admired it so much. And for me, this is a special night uh, to see somebody who influenced me so much as a student. Uh, I hope for those of you who are students in here, you're going to have the same response that I did some decades ago. Um, I guess, um, I'm really looking forward to getting to be a student again this evening. So, Dean, I want to turn it over to you. Sure. Dean Alden, a professor of urban So, I'm also going to be a little more personal in the introduction um, and say that. Um, I grew up in Spain, in Madrid, during the Franquista years, um, always looking to Catalonia and Barcelona as an example of amazing city, really good urbanism. Um, and when I went to architecture school in the late 70s, um, about the same time that Professor Busquets um, joined the faculty at the Polytechnic University of Barcelona, the whole issue of the reconstruction of cities, how we build cities, the importance of cities, what architecture's role was in cities, was front and center in the entire discourse. And I remember um, sort of personally um, 
watching the Olympics in Barcelona in 1992, and that amazing, memorable, flaming arrow shot of Antonio Rebolo to light the cauldron of the Barcelona Olympics, which became, in a way, a coming out party for Barcelona after all of those years of oppression under the regime in Madrid. And um, I remember one time, uh, not that long ago, talking with Professor Busquets about his role in planning the Barcelona Olympics. And he told me a story about um, being sent by the mayor of Barcelona to Los Angeles to see what was going on in Los Angeles and to learn about how to plan Olympics. Um, he probably didn't realize I was going to tell you this story. Um, and uh, after spending some time there, talking with the organizers, going back to Spain, and the mayor asking him, well, what did you learn about the LA Olympics? And he said, we learned not to do it like LA. <laughs> <laughs> and um, so I've been very much influenced by his work. He, he is a generation of, of architects and urban designers that sees the city as the instrument of architectural production. And um, when this book, um, I actually didn't know that this, he was working on this book. Um, when I invited him here, I knew he had been working on grids and gridded cities. Um, we are fortunate that the timing of this has worked out beautifully and that they have agreed to produce this, I think, wonderful exhibit for us. Um, and this book is just dent and the exhibit are just densely packed with lessons that we can all learn about how to structure cities. Um, Juan Busquets has won numerous, numerous awards, too many for me to kind of read. Um, for me, one of the most uh, significant of which in 2011 is the Erasmus Prize, which is not just for architects, I understand, but for really bringing, you know, kind of cultural concerns to uh, the European community. Um, he has been a professor at Harvard since 2002, and um, I'm so pleased that um, he has agreed to come down to the Lone Star State and share with us um, his, his research and his knowledge about cities. Professor Thomas Thank you. Good evening. Um, first of all, thank you, Dean Michelle Addington and Adina Alvin, for the introduction and for the invitation. For me, it's a great pleasure to, to be able to explain a research that we did for the last uh, eight years, but also to exchange um, certain ideas about how the city could be in the future, which I think is what for me is the most interesting thing. Now, also Almi was talking about the, the experience that we did in several cities in Europe, but mostly uh, probably the one in Barcelona. Today, I'm not going to talk about that because in a certain way, I feel that sometimes it's very important to try to understand what is behind and what is the, the pure essential element of urban design I don't make a big difference between urban design and what we usually call urbanism or urban architecture. I prefer that the disciplines should merge together. I don't feel that we make a lot of effort by making division and detaching. I, I feel that in the end, architects and urban, what I, I feel architects interested in the city, they have to share knowledge and we have to try to find strategies. Urbanism and urban design is about concepts, ideas, but also action. I think we have to be able to put the things in action. And that, I think, is something that interests me a lot. As I said, this uh, book and the research, the exhibit, which is down, I think it's, the gallery is beautiful, and I think the work done here at the University uh, of Texas uh, at Austin has been excellent. I'm very pleased about the exhibit. 
But I think the work is, as I said, is almost eight years of the work that we, we did at the GSD that involved approximately 100 of our students. The 100 of our students, 12 of them being uh, students of a research seminar that usually I do during the fall. Eh? And one of these uh, students is represented by Michael Keller that is present here. And they've been in the research uh, six different teaching fellows and they are very well represented by the third partner in the team that is Ding Ben Yang also present here. I'm very happy that they can be with us to, tonight because then you can see that is a, a cross research that involves also different levels into the way that the knowledge should be produced. It's not only the, the teacher makes the, the direction, of course we have our responsibility, but at the same time how the things can be done, how the, the things can be improved with the means that we have today. The first thing that probably we like to, to know is why we are calling about the regular city. I'm very interested about the grids, but a little bit beyond that. Eh? There's a great the idea why the city are becoming regular. Probably the way to understand the regularity is understanding what is not regular. Eh? Then we have here the, the confrontation that was late 19th century in Vienna between these two gentlemen, two very excellent architects, Camillo Cite and Otto Wagner. The two guys represented here, you can see clearly different actions. The one to the left, Camillo City, thinking that the good city is the city that has this idea of, like the organ, is always irregular. The right is the modern city, the idea that the city has to face different strategies to create better housing and better living for everybody, is Otto Wagner. City, the one on the left, still this confrontation exists today. We can say, still today we have this discussion continuously. City was saying, you, to Wagner, you're becoming a fanatic of the straight line. <laughs> Very clear, the idea. But I feel when we like at regular cities, and we feel that the regular cities are cities interesting in the past, and I'm, today I'm going to say, and they are very interesting for our future as well, the regular city is, means that we are adopting this idea. The second idea is that we are creating systems, like Otto Wagner is proposing here. You can see Otto Wagner is not thinking that the city is going to be like that. No, he is not designing yet the buildings. Here he is doing buildings, but here he is designing the city. And for designing the city, you need certain order, what Francois Chouet is calling certain models, not rules, models. And these models can be adaptable and can change. And I think this is something that I like very much to stress today. This idea that regularity means a type of city that Sometimes to, we think to imagine in a certain period of time it's been very rigid, but today the way that we understand regularity is quite open. Eh? It's an open city, an open type of creating this. That's the reason that we produce this research, which you can see uh, down into that, which was composed by different blocks. Eh? Today I'm going to develop a little bit of that, but not fully continuous because in one hour it's not possible to make it, but I'd like to give you a certain idea about what is the reinterpretation of the city, the regular city, how it's going to be, the, the, how the research was built, and to understand what could be the present and certain ideas about the future. We look at that. Those are the chapters I'm going to touch, and I'm going to pass through these blocks. Okay. The first idea is how you build the research in what Michel Foucault is always calling a practical knowledge. Urban architecture, urbanism, cannot be seen, presented as a science. doesn't have the, the, the body of knowledge that has a science, but needs to be a certain rational behind it. And that is what I like to express, explain today. And to do that, in a certain way, you need a certain 
base. And the base for us it was the study of the cities, and that produced the raw material. And with this material, we start going on creating a certain idea that could be, we need the facts, but we need to study the facts to get the values. The facts in itself doesn't produce any value, but we need the values why the city is better this way than the other way. And these values probably they are not 100% certain. That's the reason that our discussion is always open, is the way that we can say, the people don't like that, then we have to ask why they don't like. And we have to understand if our values are the ones correct. But when we do that, when we do the research, even that it seems that the urbanism is quite loose, it's not right that should be done, should be subjective to our feelings. In the research, we should avoid the feelings. We have to go to certain things that can be communicated as rational. And I like it very much to stress this idea because only with that we can create certain logics and these values can be transmitted. For instance, those are the cities that we study. We try to, is 101 cities. Don't ask me why is it figure. Anyway, probably when we were over 100, we were tired. Or we said, well, <laughs> it's enough. 100 is enough. OK, let's go on. The only thing, the condition is that we like to take cities that they cover all the different continents, different cities. And then we start, and you are going to see in the book, how you can represent a city in one page. I think that's very important to see how you can make the idea, which in fact is what is about urbanism, is that the cities has a certain scope, economic scope, social commitment, but at the same time the cities are always represented with a certain physical dimension, certain section, and all these elements. To make the research, we did something like above 10,000 drawings, and in the book you are going to see 1,500 that they are selected into the book. 95% of the book is original production. All the cities being redrawn. I mean, that's the way. But that's the only way. If you don't draw it, you don't know what the city is about. That's the way. And that our main body, with the computer, with, with the hand, with any means, is by drawing we can understand what the reality and how the reality can change. And of course, when we were moving through so many cities, then we will discover that the cities are different, but also we'll discover that they are, the cities are very much influenced by certain general ideas. Most of the cases, these ideas are coming from, from religion, from certain ideas, political ideas, is the way then. But you can see then how these ideas can be like the mandalas, how the mandalas can be transformed. This is how Korea is transforming this Indian architect this concept into a piece of architecture, in a way. All these things are behind this idea of the cities. The last years, we've been doing a lot of uh, studios on different cities. And then what I did is, in the last uh, uh, eight years, the studios I select, that means the, uh, the GSD, they were always regular cities, created cities like Manhattan, Chicago, Barcelona, Hangzhou. I mean, cities different. Then by comparing them is when you start creating certain values. The values are coming by contrasting the facts. How is the proportion? Are the, you can see if you put the block according to the time that the city was founded, you are going to see that at the beginning the cities, the block were relatively small. The cities are growing and today we have a mix of big blocks and small blocks. We, in our Condition today, we are mixing both, both situations. Yeah? Or you can put them in relation with the proportion. Are they more square or are they more rectangular? Then you start the section, how the section is evolving yeah, in the cities, how the, the cities are composed in the way, and that how are the elements where the city are made. By doing all that, you start creating certain values about the regular city, the users. Yeah? And until there, we are talking about facts. As I said before, we don't need to use the feelings when we design or we are researching the city. But without feelings, we cannot make research hypotheses. 
said, wait, that is very useful. We need intuitions to make that. And that probably is what is important in that moment of the research. But then you start saying, OK, we saw that the blocks are moving that. What about if, in place of one block, we take a group of blocks? And better we research nine blocks in place of a single block. That could be the way that then you said, my heart is helping to do hypotheses that will be very well received and very well rationalized in my head. That probably is the way that the research in our field should be. The second part of the research, it was about understanding how the regular city has been evolving throughout the history. Then probably what I'm going to show is quite familiar to you all. But probably you are going to see presented in a different way. For instance, the history is essential. And without understanding the history, our civilization is, is completely wrong. If we don't take the idea, for instance, of the ideal city, where that comes from, how the humanists in the Renaissance period, they were looking back to a certain period of time and by studying the monuments, by studying what the Romans and the Greeks did before, they were able to create a completely different city that was the ideal city. Then we compare the ideal city, how it was designed, and how it is. Always this is very important. We are going to talk about the ideas, but we want to see how these ideas are put in practice. Ideal city is almost exactly what is designed, is exactly what is done. And then we concentrate in this place, and then we study them, and we try to redraw them. Probably when you do that, you are not exactly doing what Durero or Vitruvius were doing. No, probably you do that, you take that from the books, and then you try to interpret. Probably what was the ideas, the way of organizing the spaces. You can see Palmanova in the, in the Benedo, beautiful city. But then you start looking at that city and try to see how this city works. Is that a modular scheme in terms of the geometry, or is that place according to the tensions of the, of the doors and how that is produced? Or Nancy, that is another fabulous city, Renaissance city, where you can see how the new city and the old city is plugged in together. That's the way. Eh? That is one way see. When you redraw the city, then you discover what is the old city and what are the, the key pieces of the new city that they try to put these two elements together. I think this is the way that probably research in urban architecture is needed in my eyes, in a way that we don't make just the repetition of the history. We try to understand why the history make these type of choices. But we don't use the method of the historians. The historians say, it was the king that was proposing to do that. No, it's the way we try to say, well, it was a king. OK, that's fine. But what is the outcome of it? And how that implies that the old and the new are well connected. And then you can see the mappings and the interpretation of these mappings. If we want to take these examples as possible ideas for designing the city of tomorrow, we have to do honestly this exercise. Otherwise, we never can be able to learn anything about the ideal city. The only thing we say, the ideal city is fantastic, it was fantastic, but today is useless. That could be the conclusion. So then we have to try to. The second is how the territory, how the regular city has been used to colonize the territory. There are many of these examples. Many. We took six of them. And one that was fascinating for us is the discovery in the south of France, this is the Pyrenees, Mediterranean and the Atlantic, it was this system that is known the Bastidas. That was the French invention in the medieval times. Yeah? They make like this pattern. You can see a city that is wallet, regular, with a plaza in the middle, an image of that. Beautiful cities today. Yeah? But look at this map. We discovered that it was like a, a certain method. We are on the 12th century. You remember that the city has been almost abandoned in the medieval times for many reasons. 
and the cities start being rebuilt after the 12th century. This land was almost empty. There were some cities, but it was almost empty. Then the French start building one city, and then allowing the people coming to the city, inside the city, to become free. They, they are not any longer servants, they are becoming citizens. Okay? Then the people were escaping from the lord that was controlling the territory, and the city was the place to, to become free. By doing that, you create a place, and these guys were able to control, to um, develop a certain region. You, what is the distance of that? Is a horse during one day? That was the, the space that you defined. And then, if not, you built another city and do another. And that was the city. It was like a, a system, a network into that place. But the British were doing the same from the other side. In the way, the confrontation, the colonization of the land, it was like two armies through the cities. The cities were the way that these two powers were. Today, all that is France, but could be a part of, of British, of UK. That's the way. I, I think this is something that then we can understand that the cities has certain shape, like this beautiful Egg Morte, that is a beautiful place. From here, um, well, it, it was the other end, uh, that would be in that particular place, uh, the, the other end. Beautiful city, very well defined. If you take the development in Latin America, yeah, there are more than 1,200 cities built according to the same law, that is the law of Indies. From these more than 1,000 cities, there are not two that they are equal, even that they have the same law. The cities cannot be done by law. The law can define the context, can define the conditions, but the cities are not defined by law. Yeah, that could be the example of that. If we go to North America, then we can see that what we usually call the 13 colonies, the, the British model was completely different. Every city has different program and different design. That could be a fantastic example of Savannah. You know this is a very well known project. But Savannah has nothing to do with New Haven, with Philadelphia. Every city has its own program. New Orleans. New Orleans is a mix between the Spanish and French. Yeah. The way that you can see the Spanish model with the plaza in front of that. Later developed by the French and finally an American city. Or you can have the beautiful Austin. Yeah. Austin is a model like that in a way that is a way it follows the pattern in a certain way. Partly a Spanish uh, pattern and later developed by a different uh, system with the French and American system. The Dutch, that they make other type of cities, the Dutch has a model, not a law, a model. The model is this one, and this model is replicated in many different contexts. You can see how this model is applied in this particular example that we can, we can see. Altogether, it makes this type of diagram. Is the way. Then you can see that the different cities, all they are based to colonize and territory, how they are, reflected in different models. Eh? That could be the Dutch model, or could be the, what we call the English, or the French, whatever. Okay. But there are another very important, uh, which, when the regular city is used to organize the territory, not to colonize, to organize the territory. Many times in the, book, in the books of history about the city, they tend to confuse and to put the two in the same basket. One thing is when I want to control one territory, the other is when I want to organize the territory. By organizing, I can control the territory, but it's another completely. For instance, the most clear example is the, the Roman. You can see that the Roman model that everybody knows, the Centuriazione, offers a system that makes Europe already. It's fascinating. But for the Romans, organizing the cities were organizing the army. And the cities, the castrum, is part of the system. And you can see Via Emilia uh, in, the, in, the, in the center of Italy. And you can see this axis. It was done according to these principles. But you can see that for the Romans, 
the key word was the infrastructure. By putting the roads, the territory was controlled. Yeah? And a camp for the army can become a city. That is this model. And you can see from the Centuriazione, which is this system, you make the Cardus and the Cumanus, and then you do the city. Yeah? And that is what you get out of it. Yeah? It's an immense uh, development, probably more than 2,000 years ago. Many people, and there are some books that they are telling, the Romans were inspiring the Jeffersonian Greek in the United States. I'm sure that you are familiar to this. It's not true. That the research, we discovered that the Roman development was rediscovered at the beginning of the 19th century when the Jeffersonian Greek was already in place. It's very interesting, this. But then we come up with another... Here you can see how the, the Roman uh, development, eh? you can see that it's very much about the infrastructure, on the roads, on the water, all this system that makes this territory so precise. But there is something in the middle, in between the Romans and United States development is the French example that they tried to develop in the mid of 19th, uh, 18th century, that is that system, you can see they want to reorganize France according to this system. Never happened. But it was very well studied, very well researched. And Jefferson, in that moment, was the ambassador of the United States in Paris. Most probably, Jefferson saw it. And when he was back in the States, he wrote something on the backpack. And probably that was the reason that that was so successful in, in America. Eh? You know that. The 13 states that has another, the Re Republic of Texas, and the rest of the country that is very well defined, but this fantastic scheme, you know, a tremendous scheme, which I think, in terms of the design, what is really amazing is that when when they put that in place from this part of the wall. The rest of America was unknown. So it was a project done without knowing the land. And I think this is magic, because in terms of when we're talking about the design of the city, sometimes we always said, no, we need the topographical map. Without the map, we cannot do a project. Hey, attention. Sometimes you are forced to give ideas in places that you don't know what is going to happen. But because the project was very rational, and probably the project has a lot of values, this project being put in place, even struggling with this problem, how do you make this system when you have the curve of the, of the earth, in a certain way, the globe has a curve, how you make this distortion possible? And that, I think, is, is a study that is very well explained there, and they produce this fantastic condition, where you can see in, in Phoenix, where the city and the open territory is that, is the same thing as the way yeah, that. According to our research, in this, uh, if the Roman, the infrastructure were able to make the city and the territory tied together, in the case of America, in some cases that works, but in many other cases, the cities doesn't follow the general scheme. Why? Because probably the organization of the United States was very much or, with the idea to organize the territory to sell the, the land, to make the land profitable. And that was the powerful of, of this, the way. Probably we can say today, if you allow me to say, United States is so important economically because they had this project. And this project made the whole country work. And attention, because that for our job, because we are designers, means very important. We are responsible for something important. Not we, the people before us, but they were very smart in doing that. I always feel the, uh, the design of the city is more important than many times we, we feel. The people say, no, design is not important, just talk about politics. Well, sometimes the design proves, and when you see uh, other examples prove, the designs make the city work. You know, and here you can see the way in the map and the way that the United States is organized with this system. It's a very, very precise system. The lines are 
not climbing the mountains, but you can see behind the mountains, again, the line continues. Eh? And I think this is the power of this design. Eh? I insist designing the unknown, which I think is very important. Eh? I think for me is is incredible as, as a fact that you can imagine that you are able to do that. Another type is the most important when we're talking about the regular cities. Immediately we'll say, well, Manhattan, this, this is clear. It's the period of the large projects. The 19th century is when it is possible to develop this. 1811, New York was only that piece, and then they proposed this gigantic, incredible project for the city. In our research, we, we try to check and to put the project over the reality. And you can see how well they fit. So wait, the project was something very precise in the layout and very flexible in the, the three dimensions. Yeah? You can then, within the block, you can do many different things. You can see how the territory was and how the territory was transformed. This Manhattan is a way that then you can see how the project was struggling with the topography to make it happen, to make the continuity happen, and probably is something that today still we can perceive in some places in Manhattan. Yeah? And then probably this city has been really the probably we, I'm, I'm convinced Manhattan never will be as important as it is today without this project. And of course, this project allows that the beginning the important part was the center of the island, and today the important part tends to be the edges of the island. But at the beginning, it was the, the heart of the island. Eh? And the other was the poor and the goods. They were coming from, from the different uh, water. Uh. The same we can say in Barcelona. I mean, Albi was referring before. When the city made this project, 1855, Cerda, that's the name of the designer, the city was as small like that. Eh? The people living in the city, they said, this guy is crazy, he's mad. Because doing a project 10 times for a city that is small is absolutely... But because of that, Barcelona exists today and is important. I always feel this way. It, there are certain projects that change the scale of the city. And I think that is something that designers, we have to be aware of that. Eh? If we do the same exercise, we can see the project and the reality. You can say, he was thinking that perhaps the blocks will be open, that way the blocks today are closed, but nevertheless, this is the same project than that. I would say even this is better than that because it has more flexibility, has more capacity of the... Yeah? You can see the means, how they were opening the streets to produce this type of city. I mean, it's amazing. It yeah? has nothing to do with Manhattan, but has the same richness, the same power. Yeah? In the research, then, we discovered that these are two important projects, but at the same time, we discovered that many other places, you know, in Italy, all the cities are doing that. In Scandinavia, the cities were, by law, cities bigger than 2,000 inhabitants, they have to do an expansion plan, by law. And then the cities make the expansion plan. That's the reason that, and, and those are other expansions in other Spanish cities. Yeah. You can see one example, Gothenburg. Yeah, that was the wallet city, and then you can see in that particular case, the expansion is done by different fragments because of the topography. That doesn't mean that the expansion has to follow the model of Manhattan. Could be different models, but you can see that it's regular. In relation with the city that has the organic that Camilo City likes, the city gets this type of uh, questions. They said the fanatism of the straight line. By the way. Or in Italy, that is Barry, Barry in the south of Italy. Okay, then we say, okay, then the conclusion is the cities, when they have to be expanded, they need a large project. That could be the conclusion of the previous chapter. No, a city could be done also by a small scale projects, very well coordinated. Those are the examples. What is that city? Sorry. What is that city about? This is London. London never have, never had a plan, like Manhattan or Barcelona. But it is an exquisite city done by fragments. All we are familiar with these fragments, the states, 
you know, like this one, beautiful places, all we like. The aristocracy make the city by fragments. One fragment, another, collage. And by understanding what is before, I add my piece, and by doing that, you create the city. And you can do fantastic. London is that way. And could be a global city even without a global plan. When we see Barcelona, I was talking about the big project, but Barcelona is also done by a small scale plazas, that is Gratia. You can see. One, another, another, another. But it's not for the aristocrats, that is for the working class. In the meantime, that the city has this gigantic project for the aristocrats, or the bourgeois people, the neighborhood, they were doing something like that with this type of places that they are very consistent. But also, with the research, we discovered that in other places, like in Senegal, then meaning in a very simple means development of the city, you can develop like that, making with the tree, several trees with the shadow, you organize a place with some water, and then you can start creating the initial part of a city. Two remarks. The first is that we don't need, sometimes we are not able to make a gigantic master plan, like in Manhattan, but we can do some strategies within the regular city. Second is that thinking that planning a city means very expensive means is not true, because you can do also some clear development with capacity of evolving, which I think is what is important, and that, I think, is the example that we can see in this case in Senegal. And then, when we're talking about the history, I'm not going to, because there are another very interesting, which, when the grid, the regular city is overlapping on the existing city, like it could be in Rome, or in Chicago, or in Paris. Eh? That's, you could see in the book, you can see in the exhibit. But I'd like just to mention probably the, one of the most exquisite moments when we are able to design a city is producing a capital city. It's the momentum where the designer has the capacity to do the, the best he or she can. Look at this example in Canberra. For us, that is very important because it's the moment where we can uh, define or we try to understand how far we can go designing the political iconography of the city, how we can do that. If you take the example of Washington, you can see the way it is built, that is redrawn, so we're trying to get certain relationship about what is done, and that was the first hypothesis done by Jefferson. You know that in the design of Washington, like in many of these capital cities, there are always several cycles into the design of the city. Jefferson was thinking that with a city like that, which is a grid, Jefferson was designing in a, in a square mesh paper, because he was always uh, loving to be an architect, but he was a politician. Yeah? But he was using that and he was doing that. And L'Enfant, that was a French um, designer working in the army in the United States, was the one that has the skills. And L'Enfant was very much impressed by Versailles, eh? at the outskirts of Paris. And in a certain way, we can see that that looks very much like us. And L'Enfant was designing this type of thing. And Jefferson would say, no, this is too much. If you do that, the speculation of the land is going to kill the project, it's impossible. Let's do that. That's enough for the capital that we need. No, it was this type. And the outcome of this struggle is that L'Enfant was fired, and then Jefferson and uh, the surveys, they were trying to continue with the spirit until making that in place, which is a quite beautiful and extraordinary city. This project was completed by the, the central piece that was done uh, by the end of at the beginning of the 20th century, by what is called the Macmillan Committee, eh? 1901, where Burden and Olmsted together, they make this uh, fantastic uh, piece uh, completing the city. But we see, for instance, in that case, that there are like three generations of ideas overlapping to make it possible. 
the example of New Delhi, where you can see that, fragment of that, the famous Brasilia, I mean, that could be in itself a discussion to imagine if Brasilia is a good or bad example. Nevertheless, I feel it's a very powerful example. Brasilia also, today, this is the Plan Piloto and the Central Park, which is almost frozen like a monument. You cannot do, you cannot change anything in this park. But besides the Plan Piloto, the pilot plan, there is another city which is gigantic, and today the city center works with the, the outskirts of Brasilia, and there is the subway running in the middle that makes this city work. Uh, I must say that um, I, I'm not supporting saying that Brasilia is an excellent case, but I would say that Brasilia, the outskirts of Brasilia are in much better condition than the outskirts of Sao Paulo or Rio de Janeiro. That means something, and so the way design helps. Anyway, and that's, but that could be another discussion. For me, what is important now is that we can see how these ideas are able, and eh? you can see the, what we can call the, the, the pilot uh, and the central axis, and you can see both sides, a gigantic city in all directions that is a growing uh, place. The capital cities, uh, just to conclude, I think is a, is a moment where we can see, and in the book you are going to see, um, architects has the chance, and some very good architects, the chance to develop and to create this idea how the iconography of the, the power could be. And many times uh, identify capital city to the, the expression of the power, but also capital city means the expression of the democracy, like it was the case in Canberra and in, mother, uh, in many other places. But when I close this chapter, that was a little bit uh, long, is the chapter that talks about how the history represents or being used the regular city. Eh? You saw different studies. I'm interested about the ideas that makes this city specific to control one territory, to organize, to make the ideal city, to make a capital. But the ideas are different. So by designers, we have. To. But in the 20th century, we can see what is clear is the grid was abandoned. The power of Le Corbusier, that he was doing that, is for to a Le Rue Corridor. We have to get rid of the street. We have to build the city like that. And you can see this is wrong, this is good. And it was Le Corbusier, it was a fantastic master, very clear, and very good for a lecture, because he was very clear, very precise, but not as efficient when he was proposing for the city, to build the city. I'm, and I'm very much respectful with Le Corbusier, I think, and, and Frank Wright, our masters. But nevertheless, we have to understand what are the actions behind the ideas. And then the actions behind that, they are not helping a lot. When we see from the tradition city to come into that, I don't think we help a lot. But that was a period where still there were some interesting architects and, and urban architects that they were keeping the track of the grid. But the, the main trend, the one that we can call, represented by the CM, the CIAM, it was very much represented by the idea that the grid is something of the past, forget about that, let's move in another direction. Fortunately, after the World War II, new forms of regularity will appear. All these diagrams, I mean, all these type of, well, for instance, just to mention, the famous project of Lou Khan for Philadelphia, I think it's a remarkable project, that he was saying, okay, you, you are under the pressure of the car, but let's take the car and the flows and design the city with that and make something better. And that is what Lucan was a start uh, putting up front. And mainly, I think in the 80s, I think the, the operation of what is called the IBA 8487 in Berlin, it makes really the momentum where the grid was back into the table. But the grid is not any longer like it was in the 19th century. Sometimes we feel and we imagine that we should go back to the 19th century to recover the grid. And probably the grid we are using today is slightly different. Here is where we enter into the other chapter where we'll talk about the, what are the new forms of the grid. We can see here that they are almost the, the shapes of the new grids are 
completely different. And then we do another atlas. Yeah? We took the projects that they are under construction. Here we were studying 48 projects. You say, why 48 and not 101? Okay, because it was very complicated to deal. But anyway, we start crossing and understanding what, again, some facts about this project, understanding that these projects today are taking into consideration other factors, how the infrastructure are part of the project, how the green is part of the project. We can say, historically, in the 19th century, for Manhattan, the Central Park was one piece in the middle. But today, the park is part of the blocks and part of the, and the infrastructure is not a site of the block, it's inside the block. Yeah? That, that probably is what we discover and you can see in the exhibit. Yeah? Then we try to see, can we discover some logics into the city design today? And then we start comparing some examples. Yeah? And then you can see how, because sometimes we said, well, the grid, and that I think perhaps today, I don't know if you share with me this opinion, sometimes we hear, well, let's put a grid because it's very practical. Let's make a grid and then allow the architects to make the architecture. But the grid is like a support. When we look at that, it's not true. The grid has a lot of shapes on it. And depending on these shapes, the type of city is quite different. And that is one of key arguments. And you can see here when you take the projects and you start redrawing, you can see how rich they are. It's not true that it's just a banal grid and let's allow the architects to do the piece of architecture. No, it's something else. And that, I think, probably is the reason that to understand the logics is important. The second is how we build the urban form. You can see that today the urban forms are slightly more complicated than, for instance, the blocks in Manhattan or the blocks in Boston or the blocks in downtown Austin. We can see that Today, is not like that. We try to establish some other type of rationals that they are more like this. Eh? You can see that the designers are taking the perimeter of the block, but it's not closed off. It's sometimes you can see the permeability. You can see certain porosity into that. The way that the buildings are built, some of them are hybrids in a way that they have several functions. That is quite... And then when we study nine different cities across, we can see the way that today the urban form is shaped, is controlled. The second consideration is that sometimes the exception into the grid could be a value. It's what we call the alterations. Look at that. This is the famous Meninas from, Baza, from Velázquez. And this is the way that Picasso is reinterpreting is the same thing with different values. And then we say, well, when we take the grid, let's consider that there are certain ways of reorganizing the grid, the block, certain angles, and to make a special places into that. Yeah? Take this example. This is the outskirts of Lyon. Probably you know this project. You know, in this place has no any value, any urban value. By making that, they create, this is, Social housing, 100%. But even with social housing, by making that, they create a center into the place. People said, I'm beyond that place. I'm be before. There's a way. That is an exception. The grids are, could be generic, and then are the exceptions that make the places. In Manhattan, everybody realized Rockefeller Center. OK. And that, what is Rockefeller Center? It's a small portion. They are putting together four blocks. But by creating a unit out of it, it makes. Or the topography that many times we feel, well, when we make a grid, avoid the topography. No, the topography can make an exclusive place like Beverly Hills. Right? Or in this particular, Lombard Street. What is Lombard Street? A very interesting place. And because they are dealing with the topography properly, they make a design which is... Or even, I think, in the case of of the campus. What is the campus? Your beautiful campus is an exception in Austin. And by making an exception, mean, meaning grouping together a certain amount of blocks and making an access that 
has to do with the other. All these things is when Paul Crick make this extraordinary. In a certain way, you can say, well, this is a project. Yes, but what for us is important is that this scale of the project in relation with the previous city has a lot to do with that. We can see that here you don't acknowledge what he is putting here. There's a way there is a, a change because of the creeks. Probably the city was growing in this direction and then it was twisted. Yeah? Almi said before it was 17 degrees. The way that the Greeks was twisted because of the geography. Is the way, yeah? that, and then producing probably interesting places or probably places that needs a lot of attention, like could be the continuation. <laughs> okay. But today, the way we design the city, we try to integrate the layers. Right? So the way we can see that today, it's very difficult to, in these projects that we are studying, we can see that the infrastructure and the city is part of the same design. Right? It's not like it was before where we say, Infrastructure is a site, and then the blocks are inside. No, they are together. Eh? For instance, that you take King Cross in London. Is that infrastructure? Is that blocks? What is it? It's everything. In certain way. And then, of course, within this regularity, this building could be done by Mr. E, this is Mrs. C, and all that is possible. Different initiatives. But there is certain logic integrating, and I think this is what we discover. Eh? or this recent project in Barcelona, where you have the infrastructure below, that is the train, and by creating this, is a sort of high line in Barcelona, it's cheaper than the high line in, in Manhattan, <laughs> nevertheless, but this is a very popular area, and by doing that, you create a space where the two communities are meeting together. That, that could be the type of option. So you can see the role of infrastructure in these projects are always very important. But in the end, you can see that that is nothing to do with the 19th century city. It's something completely dealing with the problems of today. I mean, even dealing with the, the problems of how the architects are building the city today, there is a certain tendency, at least in Europe, where the cacophonic of the architects, in a way, eh? every architect says, I'm better than you, in a, way that, in a way that they need more space, you can see in this image. But anyway, that is a culture of our moment, in a way, that could change in 10 years and could be in a different position. The way that the infrastructure, water, the green, the green is part of the project, is the central part of the project. The scales could change, but you can see the idea of diversity, diversity Never you repeat the, the piece of architecture. You can see that, by the way. That. Well, you can see that the buildings are above the infrastructure. This is Paris. So that then you build the, the system for the train with a certain uh, rim that could also support that. It's more expensive, yes. But that's the only way that you, you solve the gap between infrastructure and the city. And in the end, I think... The problem today is that we are facing a transformation. That could be one speculation that we did in our studios about how Barcelona can be densified. But in a certain way, we, we feel that we are facing a very interesting challenges today. Yeah? Probably when the Renaissance were talking about the discovery of the perspective, when in the 20th century the plane make us change the way that we draw the city. Yeah? Remember that when Le Corbusier took the first plane going to Moscow, he changed completely the way of representing and designing the city. Because he discovered that that was very powerful. And today we are struggling trying to make the city within the complexity, making models that they are uh, impossible to handle, but just trying to understand that the city is not just a physical form, but has also infrastructure, has social infrastructure, has also questions that they are changing. But today we, we see that our cities are also re-discovering uh, from this fantastic tool, eh? all we like at the Google. But you see that the Google put us, the Google put us outside. In a way, from outside, we enter into the city. Traditionally, that was not the way. 
because even the plane was looking continuously to the city and landing to that place. Today, this creates something that, in my eyes, is very interesting. I think we like, we love the Google, but at the same time, it presents us a certain idea of immateriality, no? So the way that we can be anywhere and we can approach to that place. And when we confront that, I think we have to be at the same time with this Google mania that I think we are using on the telephones and all these things. But at the same time, we have to understand that our world has a level of complexity that you must tackle. And the only way of tackle is considering the Google, but coming down and understanding what, what really was happening in that place, in this particular place. And then is when I feel that the new issues that we are trying to, to address are questions that they are very important. Everybody is talking, and I'm sure the school you have the same type of discussion about how we can create the city that could be more sustainable, and what does it mean, what are the means for that, huh? and how we can produce uh, the answer to this question. How our society can become more uh, addressing the question of the social justice. I mean, those are questions that we as designers, we have to take in seriously. Huh? But sometimes the answer tend to be an answer that imagine that the solutions are always very complicated. You know, when we're talking about the smart cities, everybody, what is the city that don't want to be smart? All the cities are competing. I'm smarter than you are, in a way. Honestly, what I feel is important is that the citizens has to be smart. And we have to prepare our designs and our proposals in order that the citizens can appropriate these elements. That's the reason I feel that for instance, we have many innovations today, but probably one of the most interesting is this one. Why? Because almost everybody is using that. And that, in that moment, meaning that that could be part of our design. And if that can help making the mobility smarter, then that is the good solution. If not, the solution is going to be only applicable in Germany, places that they can pay for everything in a way that but otherwise, if the rest of the world cannot share, forget about that. I mean, we have to create systems. And that's the reason that I'm so in favor of this idea of being able to introduce certain tools that the people can understand. And I think the idea of regularity, even that you can say that we are fanatics of certain order, but the order and the chaos can be really combined if there are certain rules. And that's the reason I feel that the, the power of the, of the regular city is tremendous. When we say that the nature and the city can be combined, you can see a diagram like that, and you can see that it is possible to make an effort and to make that the green enters into the city, and you don't need to change a lot of our cities. If you imagine Austin is a city where the green and the city, they are mixed but they can be very much together. You know, these proposals, or when you see, for instance, using uh, the examples from this book, uh, from, uh, that you know very well, the, in, in a way that probably when Steiner was doing this book, uh, making plans, was mentioning clearly the, the role of Jan Mahar doing this gigantic proposal, very ambitious proposal for the region, or how in that moment, I mean, the proposal from uh, Michael Van Barker, book, those are things that you can very well imagine that if the priority changes and then you introduce the idea that the city and the green can match together, probably the city this idea of the city, the sustainable city, is quite possible. Look at that image. No? This is already built. Is that is a street and has the same dimension as the street, but the use of the street allows you to bring a car to enter to your house, but also the raining water is is passing by. 
or you have places like that. Yeah? I think this already, to show that probably the city of the future, if we try to clarify certain principles, is not so difficult to achieve. Is the way those buildings, perhaps, they require another type of insulation. They have other type of, but in the end, it's a building that looks like a, a normal building. And with this method, we can imagine that the old and the new can play together because we are able to refurbish all buildings within these logics. And I think this is, for us, what makes sense when we're talking about the a certain idea that the regularity into the city is able to produce a powerful frame, a frame that is, I insist, is not repeating the city of the past, even that the city of the past we saw today had a lot of advantages, but today the city of the future could be, and I think this is my, uh, my point, the city of the future has to better than the city of the past, otherwise we are we don't deserve the job that the society is giving to us. Thank you very much.